Chapter 14 The stiletto of Vogue's clattered off the nearest wall and skittered across the floor. The doctor, having thrown it away from him, and Cassie's throat, with a furious roar, had then dropped to his knees, his head clutched in his hands. And then he started rocking backwards and forwards, making odd mewing noises. It took Barry a couple of seconds to register that the barrier was no longer there. It had collapsed at the same time that the doctor had, and it took him less than a second to cover the few yards to the table, where he snatched Cassie and ran back to Louise before the Archie Mage could work out what was going on. Take her! Barry snapped at Louise, looking round the throne room for some means of escape. The doors that they had originally come through were gone, and Barry had a vague recollection of them vanishing after the Archie Mage had cast an incantation. He shook his head. He was still carrying two sets of memories around in his head, although those of Barry Brown seemed to be taking precedence. He looked back at the Archie Mage, but he was more concerned with the doctor's condition than that of his prisoners. Though that wasn't much help if he, Louise and Cassie were trapped in the throne room, was it? And then he saw it, another door, immediately behind them, and it was sliding open like a lift. Grabbing Louise's arm, Barry pulled her and the baby through the door and held his breath as he saw the Archie Mage look up and stare straight at him. But then the door slid shut and the little room started to descend with a sigh of relief. Barry realised that it was a lift, although its complicity in their escape was a mystery to him. Bet you're glad to be out of there, came the cheery and oddly familiar voice. Barry looked around the lift with a mixture of panic and bewilderment but he, Louise and Cassie were the only people in sight. Don't bother looking for me. I'm all around you. I'm the lift, the voice continued. I gathered that you were having problems, so I thought I'd give you a hand. Not that I have any hands, it babbled, but you know what I mean. Where are we going? asked Louise. Well, I'd take you down to the foyer, but I really don't think that you want to go down there at the moment. Why the hell not? barked Barry, still uneasy about the idea of a sentient lift because there's an army of Thaumaturgs and Cybrids, commanded by the Hierophant and the Technomancer, I might add, advancing on the Tower of Abraxas, that's why. And despite the fact that two of you are elevated Cybrids, you might be torn from limb to limb in the confusion. Why the concern? asked Louise. There was a significant pause before the lift replied. I'm a decent lift, that's why. Now what if I drop you off on the first floor? You can wait there for the fisticuffs to finish. Okay. Barry paused, weighing up a question in his mind. OK, but do me a favour. If I can. Go back to the Archimage's throne room. I think the doctor might need you. The lift shuddered to a halt. The doctor? Oh, you mean the dark one. Don't you mean the Valyard? corrected Louise. Oi! chastised the lift. Don't use that sort of language in here if you don't mind. It opened its door. I'll go back for the dark one. Um, I mean the doctor. Just get a move on, it urged. Things are going to get nasty, and I want to be as far from the ground floor as I can. Stepping out of the lift, Barry looked back into its mirrored interior. Why did you help us? Really? The lift closed its door, but not before it muttered something which took Barry a few seconds to understand. And when he did so, he smiled. What is it? asked Louise. The lift, Lou, the lift. It was Vincent. He shrugged and looked around the transformed first floor. It was empty, a great golden void with windows everywhere. He ran over to one of the windows, and the view took his breath. Look, he urged. And as soon as Louise and Cassie joined him, he allowed himself to fully appreciate what was happening outside the tower. Hundreds of cybrids and thaumaturgs were waiting impatiently around the base of the tower, all dressed in their battle armour and wielding staves and battle whips, and behind them in the distance, as still as statues, were the Hierophant and the Technomancer, tiny figures brimming with barely restrained power. Barry shuddered. The great kingdom was at war, and the remaining part of his Bartholomew persona was shouting one thing. They were facing Armageddon. The doctor opened his eyes to see the Archie Mage standing over him with a concerned expression. But what were they doing in his throne room, he wondered. The last thing he remembered was feeling faint, but that had been in the labyrinth of thaumaturgy. And why had he changed out of his wonderful jacket only to put on this ridiculous garb? 
As he considered the black robes, a terrifying thought entered his head, and the Archimage's next question confirmed his worst nightmares. Are you recovered, Valiard? Valiard? The force of the memories almost made the doctor vomit. In his arrogance, he had assumed that his Time Lord nature had rendered him immune to the quantum mnemonic of the Millennium Codex. In truth, it had worked its magic in a far more sinister and insidious way, and he had ignored all the clues, such as the gradual transformation of his clothing. And that arrogance had left him completely unprepared when the final metamorphosis had overcome him, the quintessence of his darker nature erupting from the hidden recesses of his soul and dressing his mind and body in its foul garments. For the last few hours, he had become the one thing he feared and despised above all else. Forget the Daleks or the Cybermen. The most dangerous force in the universe was a creature possessing all of the Doctor's intellect and abilities, but with none of his moral scruples. Facing such a being across a Time Lord courtroom had been bad enough, especially with the Master tittering over the situation from the depths of the Matrix. But to know that he had lived the life of that monster made the Doctor feel unclean to the core of his Gallifreyan soul. And that was a long way down indeed. He rose unsteadily, trying not to flinch at the Archimage's helping hand. His main priority now was to return to the labyrinth and undo this abortion of reality before he reached the point where his subconscious could no longer free him from the clutches of the Valiard. Valiard, the Archimage repeated. The forces we were unleashing are cruel and wishful, Magnus Ashmael, the Doctor replied, trying very hard to impersonate the sneering pretension of his alter ego. I was momentarily overcome by them. The Archimage frowned. But you are the Valiard. There is no force in the Great Kingdom that can stand against you. He was unprepared. It will be different the next time. Next time? We have lost the child, Valiard. The Archimage wandered to the window and looked out, and then bellowed, By the gods! The Doctor joined him and saw the reason for the Archimage's distress. An army of Cybrids and Thaumaturgs was surrounding the Tower of Abraxas, and even as they watched, the army started to advance. How could they have approached so close without my being warned? Unless Anastasia and Melophir have united to erect unyielding wards. He waved his hand. But that is irrelevant now. We must defend ourselves. He squeezed his eyes shut and started muttering under his breath. The doctor guessed that he was ordering his own Auric forces to attack the armies. With a shudder, he realized that the carnage would be unthinkable and despite the alien appearance of the protagonists, they were all human beings, people who had been milling around the streets of London innocently preparing to celebrate the new millennium. He had to get through to the remnants of Mel and Anne and try to persuade them to call off their attack before things got really unpleasant. They've come for me, he stated. How did you come to that conclusion? Because the Hierophant has just communicated with me, he lied. She will call off her army if I am delivered to her. There he thought smugly. That should do it. Really? asked the Archimage, raising an eyebrow. Despite the Hierophant's great powers, he sneered, she could never breach the tower's four walls with her mind. That is one of the fundamental laws of the Great Kingdom. So why did you lie to me, Valyard, unless... he nodded in realization. Unless you aren't the Valyard. That's it, isn't it? You've reverted to that self-righteous doctor... He snapped his fingers, and two aurics entered the throne room. I watched you destroy two of my aurics earlier. Doctor, I watched through their eyes. I felt their deaths. And yet I wonder whether victory will be so assured against aurics who have drunk deep of my power. And it did seem that these brutes were larger than their fellows, with a faint golden aura surrounding their bodies. And once you are defeated, I shall continue from where we left off, I will retrieve the child and confront the gods in the tabernacle and watch as they beg for mercy while their very lifeblood is drained from them. While the Archimage continued his dreams of glory, a small voice in the doctor's mind started whispering to him, telling him that a simple incantation would leave the oryx burning cadavers on the floor. But he was well aware of the consequences of that course of action. Any use of the powers that had been granted him by the Millennium Codex would guarantee his transformation into the Valyard. A massive explosion rendered such considerations irrelevant. 
Both the Doctor and the Archimage were knocked off their feet by the blast, which the Doctor estimated came from the very base of the tower. With a sinking feeling, he realised that the battle and the bloodshed had begun. Scrambling to his feet, the Doctor glanced at the Archimage, but he was too preoccupied with his incantations to pay him any attention. And then something else caught the Doctor's eye. The sleeve of his robe was lighter, the patterns of his jacket visible. Perhaps his transformation into the Valyard was avoidable, after all. He skirted round the two dazed Oryx and tried to locate the lift that had come to his aid the last time he had escaped from the Archimage's clutches, but the walls were a uniform gold. Even the doors through which he and the Archimage had entered were gone, their absence the result of some spell or other. Of course, he exclaimed. Using his borrowed powers to destroy an Auric was one thing, but a simple incantation of egress wouldn't damn him, would it? He concentrated and muttered a short sentence that his brain told him would work. To his relief, a set of gilded double doors faded into existence in the featureless wall. Running from the throne room, he was too busy with his escape to notice that his robes were once again a featureless jet black. Louise sat up and rubbed the back of Cassie's head to quieten her. The explosion had thrown them both to the floor, and she had only just managed to protect her daughter from the impact. This is it, Barry, she whispered. We're going to die. Be quiet, he snapped. I don't understand what's going on any more than you do, but there's got to be a way out of this situation. I mean, look at you and me. It's Barry and Louise, not Bartholomew and Luella. Perhaps everything will just revert back to normal, and we can get on with our lives. I just wish we could pick and choose what changed. Louise stroked the back of his hand. You're thinking about your real mother, aren't you? He laughed. That's very selfless of you, Lou, but no. I was thinking about Cassie. He nodded at the sleeping child. I always suspected that I was her father, you know. Why didn't you tell me? Why did you always claim that it was that ex of yours, the one who moved up to York, never to be seen again? Because of the way she is. Was, that's why. And then she sighed. The lies that she had told over the years, she thought, all because of her headstrong determination to prove to people like her father that she could stand on her own two feet. Given their current predicament, what was the point of lying any more? No, there's more to it than that. I just wanted to prove to everybody that I could cope on my own, that I didn't need a man to support me. That was when I first got pregnant. And then, when I saw Cassie's deformities, well, I didn't love her any less. In fact, it made her even more special. But I didn't want to burden you with any guilt or blame. Burden? How could I ever think of Cassie as a burden? He said in a shocked tone. Even before I realised that I was her dad, I loved her. Why the hell did you think I kept coming round? Not your cooking, that's for sure. He winced as she kicked his leg. I've always loved Cassie, and I've always loved you. And even if she does change back... I'll never stop feeling that way. He swallowed, and Louise understood the pain that he was going through. I was adopted, Lou. I never knew my real parents, never had any sense of belonging, of continuity. I don't want Cassie to go through what I went through. He looked away in embarrassment as his voice filled with emotion. Louise could feel the tears welling up in her eyes. It was something she had considered before she had even become pregnant but her stubbornness had always stood in the way, backed up by her internal justification that marriage wouldn't change the relationship that she and Barry had. But now she wanted commitment, not from Barry. She already had that. It was commitment from herself that she needed. She looked him in the eyes through the blur of tears. Barry, when this is all over, why don't we, well, get married? He threw back his head and roared, That'll be one to tell Cassie when she's older, won't it? I can see it now. When she asks about how we got married, we can tell her that Mummy proposed to Daddy in a building with talking lifts while goblins and demons fought a pitched battle outside. And then he reached out and hugged both Louise and Cassie, tears in his eyes now. But yes, Lou, yes, of course I'll marry you. The voice that boomed out from behind them was rich and fruity. Wonderful. I do so love a good wedding. The doctor still in the disturbing black robes, was standing behind them, hands on hips. Instinctively, Louise stepped back, but he threw his arms open. You have nothing to worry about, I assure you. 
That side of my nature is locked away, and that's where it's going to stay. He inclined his head towards the central pillars which housed the lift shafts. Now we've got to get out of here, but somehow we must avoid being torn apart in the altercation one floor below us. Louise shuddered. The last time she had seen the doctor, he had been preparing to sacrifice her daughter, but the cruelty and malice that had coloured his voice and nature had been replaced by the trusting tones that had won her over in that café in Greenwich, something that seemed centuries ago. The lift told us to wait here until the battle was over, offered Barry. That's all well and good, countered the doctor, but by then hundreds of people will have died. But they're goblins. As were you, Louise, replied the doctor. You two remember your previous existence, don't you? They nodded. The Cybrids, Thaumaturgs and Oryx preparing to tear one another limb from limb out there are probably poor unfortunates who were revelling in Trafalgar Square. The entire population of the Great Kingdom comprises the human beings trapped in the triangle Ashley Chapel set up between the Millennium Hall, the Library of St. John in Holborn, and here, in Canary Wharf. You mean they're all real? Like us? asked Barry. But why aren't they remembering what everything is supposed to be like? I mean, we are. The doctor shrugged. Perhaps it has something to do with your proximity to the Millennium Ziggurat when the Codex was run. Or maybe it was something else. He shook his head. I'll be honest with you. Whatever transformed London is as much a mystery to me as it is to you. All I do know is I don't want even more bloodshed on my hands. They've already started fighting, Doctor, said Barry. No, they've stormed the entrance, but the Oryx haven't engaged them yet. It's me that Anastasia and Melophia want, and as soon as I make my grand entrance, this senseless carnage can be avoided. The first wave of the unprecedented Cybrid Thaumaturg Alliance broke through the glass boundaries of the Tower of Abraxas with surprising ease. Their mantric grenades had cut through the tower's wards, taking out the physical barriers with an explosion which had nearly knocked them off their feet. But finally the vestibule was theirs to command, its few auric defendants ripped to shreds by thaumaturgs in their mindless fighting frenzy. And then nothing. No more oryx. No sudden attacks by the expected guardian spirits. Nothing. The general of the cybrid forces turned to his silvered equivalent. This is wrong, Elaine. The tower is virtually open to attack. General Gargle scratched his blunt blue nose with a taloned hand. I expected far more resistance than this. The Thaumaturg nodded. As did I, Gargle, as did I. Where are the Oryx, spoiling for blood? He shook his head. I had hoped for a valiant battle, my friend, not an empty victory amongst these deserted halls. Patience, Elaine. The Cybrid pointed towards the thick columns of gold and marble in the centre of the vestibule. The lift shafts are there, he announced, but I am unsure as to whether that would be the best route of assault. The Archimage is probably holding the Dark One in his throne room, and to use the lift would announce our presence. Elaine smiled, revealing pointed golden teeth. Agreed, friend Gargil. I suggest... He broke off as a familiar but exhilarating noise filtered through from outside the tower. The flapping, screeching cacophony could only be one thing. The anticipated attack by the Oryx, the only inhabitants of the Great Kingdom capable of airborne assault. We must stand at the head of our armies, Gargil, shouted Elaine. We must fight! No! snapped the Cybrid, clamping his sharp claws around the Thaumaturg's stick-like upper arm. Our priority is to rescue the Dark One, not engage in battle with the Oryx. But the laws of the Kingdom? To perdition with the laws. We have our orders from both the Hierophant and the Technomancer. We are inside the tower. I suggest that we make the best use of that fact and storm the throne room. A sudden mental image from the Technomancer filled his mind. Although the Archimage's mystic defences interfered with the vision, the intention was clear. There was a stairwell in the corner of the vestibule, a stairwell which led eventually to the throne room. But there are only two of us, argued Gargil. We are warriors of the great kingdom, my friend, and we fight for the good of that kingdom. I can think of no better cause, can you? They reached the hidden door to the staircase and hurried inside. This is carnage, screamed the technomancer as she ignited a swooping auric with a man tri torpedo. The hierophant was on her knees, her stave fending off another of the homed creatures. For a second, Melophia wondered why her peer was resorting to such direct tactics, 
but quickly decided that Anastasia was actually enjoying the action. We must hope that Gargill and Elaine locate the Dark One quickly, she called, just before she beheaded the Auric. Its decapitated torso fell heavily to the beige sand and vanished in the purple flame that issued from the Hierophant's hands. The Oryx may have taken their time in arriving, but they are certainly making up for it. She pointed towards the battleground, where the Oryx were attacking with unprecedented ferocity. The Archimage was undoubtedly behind their magnified strength and bloodlust, and that left her with only one option. With a muttered incantation, she granted her army a portion of her power. Louise pointed as the door handle to the first floor, gold, in keeping with all of the tower's fixtures and fittings, turned downwards. Back to the other side of the room, the doctor ordered, as the door was flung open to reveal the incongruous sight of a cybrid and a thaumaturg together. With instincts honed in a different reality, Barry and Louise triggered the transformation of their blue armour to cover them. But the cybrid stepped forward with his taloned hands outstretched in a gesture of peace. Bartholomew, Luella, surely you recognize Gargil, warlord to the Technomancer, he asked in a gruff voice. Louise's brow furrowed as she tried to remember her other life as a member of Melifier's court. And yes, the cybrid in front of her was the same Gargil that had bored them all during countless banquets with his endless tales of war and battle. Of course, Gargil, what are you doing here? He nodded over her shoulder. The Dark One, we're here to rescue him. Me? asked the doctor. I'm honoured. Don't be, whispered the thaumaturg in his sibilant tones. My mistress wanted you dead. Only the technomancer's intercession saved you. The doctor raised an eyebrow. Good old Mel, he muttered. Anyway, I suppose we should be off. I take it that this bloodshed will cease as soon as we're clear of the tower. Of course, Gargill answered. The entire campaign was engineered to liberate you from the Archimage and I admit to being disappointed that you managed that feat without our assistance. I was looking forward to testing the Archimage in combat. Can we stop this bloodthirsty conversation and get out of here? Snapped the doctor irritably. The sooner this senseless conflict is over, the better. Very well, said Gargill, pointing at the door. A sudden noise drew their attention. The lift door was opening. All aboard who's coming aboard, came Vincent's cheery voice. After you said the doctor, bowing and holding out his arm for Louise. She smiled. Perhaps they would get out of this nightmare after all. From her position on the promontory, the Hierophant reached out with her mystic senses in an attempt to contact her warlord. For long moments there was nothing. But then... They have the doctor, she shouted. I can see through Elaine's eyes. They are bringing him out, and your elevated cybrids are with them. She span round as an auric dropped from the sky towards her. With a sharp flick of her wrist, it exploded in a ball of purple fire. Bartholomew and Luella? The technomancer frowned. She hadn't even been aware that her chancellor and her major domo were absent from the ziggurat. What were they doing in the archimage's lair? I'll tell my cybrids to fall back as soon as they're clear of the tower. I suggest that you order your thaumaturgs to do the same. My dear Melifere, do not presume to question my skills in warfare, she snapped. I was waging war in the kingdom when you were a suckling at your mother's teat. The moment that they are away from the tower, this skirmish will end. I do not relish bloodshed any more than you do. Reassuring words. But Melifere wasn't completely satisfied that she believed the Hierophant's peaceful intentions. The chance to engage in conflict after years of isolation in the labyrinth was frighteningly alluring. And as she destroyed the auric that was running towards her, she realized just how alluring. The vestibule of the tower was disturbingly peaceful, the heavy crystal doors keeping the noise of the conflict at bay. Elaine and Gargill stepped out of the stairwell, looking around the red gold chamber for any signs of ambush, followed up the rear by Barry, Louise and the Doctor. The vestibule is clear, growled Gargill. We must make haste before the Oryx sense our presence. Elaine and I will defend you through the battlefield. The Technomancer and Hierophant are waiting on a hillock overlooking the tower. How's Cassie holding up? asked Barry. Better than I am, Louise quipped. She's fast asleep. And perfectly normal, she reminded herself. A sudden pang reminded her of something more mundane. You know, I'd kill for a cigarette right now. He nodded. 
a ciggy and a pint of lager. Sounds like paradise. He grinned. As soon as this is over, I'm going to take you to the White Lion and we're both going to get totally plastered. Further musing over the future ended abruptly. Leaving so soon? The voice was rich and resonant and came from a spot between them and the huge doors. Half a second later, a burst of amber light exploded in front of them, fading to reveal the Archimage in his tarnished battle armour. I'm hurt by your rejection of my hospitality. It's over, Ashmael, shouted the doctor. As soon as we're back in the labyrinth, I fully intend to put an end to this charade. Really? And how do you propose to return to the labyrinth, eh? I fully intend to keep you here until you fulfil your earlier promise and breach the Wall of Tears. The doctor shook his head. Never. The Great Kingdom is an abomination which must be stopped before any more lives are lost. Like this, you mean? The Archimage stabbed a finger at Gargil, who sank to his knees in obvious agony, crackling electricity surrounding him in a vicious aura. Stop that, ordered the doctor. Why don't you make me, laughed the Archimage, or do you fear your powers that much? Gargle was choking, his talons clutching at his throat. If the assault continued much longer, the Cybrid would most certainly die. The doctor's face was a mask of horror. His earlier statement about not using his powers was clearly tearing him apart. Was he that frightened of what might happen that he would stand by and let Gargill die? Louise caught a movement beside her and was horrified to see Barry launching himself at the Archimage. Ignoring her shouts to stay back, Barry threw a heavy punch at the Archimage's unprotected face. As the Archimage stumbled backwards, momentarily stunned, he ceased his attack on Gargill. Run! screamed Barry, rubbing his bruised fist. Elaine helped Gargill to his feet and headed towards the door, but Louise's fear paralysed her, and then she realised that the Archimage was getting up. Barry, look out! she bellowed, realising that he hadn't spotted the Archimage's recovery. You presumptuous insect! snarled the Archimage, his eyes ablaze with anger. You dare to attack the Archimage of Abraxas? He raised his fist, burning with supernal fire. No! screamed Louise. She tried to run over to him, but the doctor restrained her. You'll get yourself killed, he yelled. We've got to get out of here. I'm not leaving Barry. With a tug, she pulled herself clear of the doctor's grasp, only to stumble over her own feet. To her horror, she lost hold of Cassie, who slid across the floor in the direction of the Archimage, and then she banged her head on the cool marble floor. A gift, he muttered, pulling the child towards him in a telekinetic grip. How kind. And then he unleashed his full power at Barry. The last thing Louise saw before she lost consciousness was Barry, her friend, her confidant, her lover, and the father of her child, vanish in a blinding conflagration. And standing behind the flames with an expression of triumph etched into his features was the Archie Mage, a screaming Cassie in his arms. And then merciful blackness overcame her.